Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you happen to be joining me from. This is Jim McKeith, Chief Developer Advocate and Engineer from Barcadero Technologies, and welcome to Windows 10. What is the latest with the VCL? For our agenda today, we're going to start out a little bit of talking about just the difference between FireMonkey and VCL, because that's every time I talk about VCL, I always get a question about the FireMonkey. Uh, then we're going to look at Windows 10, its APIs, what is the UWP? Then we're going to go back and talk about VCL foundations, uh, what's new for in the VCL for Windows 10, and then look at using Windows RT APIs in Delphi, and finally bridging the Windows API and the WinRT API with the new Windows desktop bridge. This is something I, I originally, I think Marco Cantu originally said this, but I decided to add it attributed to everybody because VCL has been the best development library for Windows desktop applications forever since since it came out. And it continues to be so with Windows 10. So no one really debates that. <laughs> there are other libraries out there, but they're really, anybody that's used both, everybody agrees, VCL is by far the best. So what does that mean as far as FireMonkey? How does these compare? Uh, there's a link down there in the lower right-hand corner you can see that that's, I go through and list out a, a very a detailed difference between the two and when, what are the advantages of one versus the other. But generally speaking, VCL is mature, um, but it also continues to receive updates and bug fixes. That's something that's really important. So you don't see as many changes in VCL as you do in FireMonkey because FireMonkey is newer, although FireMonkey is starting to mature more. But it does receive updates and bug fixes. VCL is tied to Windows only and Windows APIs. FireMonkey is designed to be cross-platform. They both include owner-drawn and native components. FireMonkey has the ability to change a component to be platform uh, rendered instead of owner-drawn, instead of styled. So uh, that is available in both FireMonkey and VCL. Um, FireMonkey does have some more things to make it more flexible, the ability to have animations and effects and things like that on there. Most, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about as far as WinRT features later on work with FireMonkey as well. You can have a FireMonkey application uh, can take advantage of WinRT. It can become a universal Windows platform application and be in the Windows store. So uh, those things, even though we're going to focus on VCL, are all open to FireMonkey as well. I'm going to show you a little bit of the difference between VCL and FireMonkey. So this is the VCL application. I'm going to go ahead and run it. I have this little utility here called uh, WinSpy++. And what this does is you can drag, and you notice it's highlighting all these different windows here. But I can drag this in here, and I can select that control. And you can see it can read the caption, is edit one, can read the text out of it, and see the class, and some other information about it. So this is because... Windows or VCL is based on Windows controls. Now, some of these controls are owner drawn controls, which means the VCL draws the control themselves, but all the controls have a Windows handle. So they can all be, well, not all the controls. Uh, a, a label does not. See, I cannot grab all that label. Now, there's the, what is this? The static, t static text, I think it is, that has a, a, a handle. So, but anyway, I'm getting off track. The, t the edit one has a label, or it has a handle. If I click in here, this uh, menu is defined by Windows. Uh, all the behavior inside this is defined by Windows because this is a Windows edit box wrapped up by the VCL's T-Edit. Now here is a FireMonkey control application, and this is a FireMonkey T-Edit. Now watch this when I run this here. Oops, helps if I run the right one. So this looks about the same as the VCL one. Actually, I can run the VCL one side by side. So it looks pretty similar, right? When I click in there, you know, I can click in here and edit the text, stuff like that. But then watch this when I come here and grab this guy and point at the FireMonkey application, you notice I cannot target that one directly. I can go the form, right? I can see the capture of the form is form 35 because the form has to be a window or has to have a Windows handle in order to be a window on Windows. 
So that's because everything in here is owner drawn, just like the label was in VCL. But I can change that. I can come here to this guy and where is it at? Control type. I can change control type from styled to platform. See the little icon here in the corner now? That means this is now a platform rendered edit box. Not all controls on all platforms have this, but a number of them where it's important have this functionality. So now when I run the FireMonkey application and grab the thing here, look at that, your text here. So it's a TWIN native edit inside there. So it's actually uh, embedding a native edit, edit box inside the FireMonk application, which gets a Windows handle and all that other behavior. And again, I can right click here and I can get the full one. I didn't even show you. If I right click on inside a, uh, a FireMonk edit box, it's not the platform st it's styled instead of platform. You get a slightly smaller, you get a slightly smaller list. It doesn't include these options here, I believe. It just includes from here up which I'm not sure why I would need these. I never would use them, but you might need them. And if you do, then there you go. That's the difference. Um, although you can extend that as well uh, on FireMonkey. But there you go. That's little subtle differences there between FireMonkey. So let's talk about Windows 10, the fastest growing version of Windows. Uh, largely attributed to the fact that Microsoft was giving away free, I think the, the free upgrade path has ended now, ended now for uh, end user consumers. In the business uh, situations, a lot of businesses have received licenses but haven't upgraded yet or are working in slowly rolling it out over large enterprise deployments. Microsoft's Windows, though, is still the world's number one desktop operating system, holding 90%, 90 point, almost 90.5% of the market share across all its different versions. Wow, it still dominates desktops, which of course all of you know, which is why you're using VCL for Windows development. Um, my, although migration to Windows 10 is expected to be faster than in previous versions, as according to a Gartner survey, 85% of enterprises will have started or finished their Windows 10 deployment by the end of 2017. So by the end of the year, ever, most everybody is going to be moving on to Windows 10 if they aren't already there. So let's talk a little bit about Windows timeline. We're going to go back to uh, 1995 which is when Windows NT 3.1 came out, uh, which is what introduced the Win32 API. Uh, there was Windows for work groups and Windows and all these other things previous to this, but this is when the Win32 API came out. Uh, it was had to do with the partnership they're doing with OS2 at the time and the reworks around some of those APIs. So this was a pretty big step forward. Uh, the VCL was introduced around this time as well, and it had strong interaction with the platform APIs. It was designed to be a light wrapper around these platform components and was able to interact strongly with the all the platform APIs. Fast forward a few years, we see Windows XP and Windows Vista come out. During Windows XP's timeframe, .NET is introduced. And Microsoft said that in the future, .NET would be the only platform API that you would use. And Windows Vista was supposed to be uh, .NET only, but that didn't happen. Uh, Windows Vista shipped with .NET installed, but even inside Microsoft, there was a really strong resistance to abandoning the uh, benefits of native development and the Win32 Win API. So it, it, we never saw that take off. Windows Vista included .NET out of the box and so did later versions of Windows, but .NET really never saw a huge uptake on the uh, desktop. Then along comes Windows 8. Windows 8, they introduced the WinRT API. It was an entirely new API, separate from both uh, Win32 and .NET. Um, and uh, Microsoft said, had this idea that everybody was going to use JavaScript to develop their desktop applications, and that was going to be the future. Uh, they said JavaScript everywhere. Everybody's going to be using JavaScript. And the reason they did this is because JavaScript is very, very popular. A lot of people are using JavaScript. But nobody wants to use JavaScript to build a desktop application. Um, 
<laughs> I could say some things about JavaScript. It's 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 great for some things. It's not great for everything. Let's leave it at that. So it, that didn't happen. It did not become a JavaScript Windows world. So that brings us to today with Windows 10. Uh, in Windows 10, Microsoft added the ability for interoperability between all of these uh, APIs. So in previously, it was there was some interoperability available, but it was really complicated and kind of a pain. But in Windows 10, they make it really, really easy for all these APIs to interop together. So what they've done by doing that is they've taken Win32 and brought it back to being a uh, primary language or primary API for Windows 10. So this is a huge step forward. Uh, in Windows, Windows 8, they, uh, WinRT was the primary API and in order to be uh, Windows 8, you had to be using Windows R WinRT. Well, you could do, still do Windows Win32, but they're really pushing WinRT. And there were some things you couldn't get to except through WinRT on Windows 8. In Windows 10, you can develop a native application with Win32 and still access those WinRT APIs and do everything, get access to all the platform features. So that's a huge step forward. Um, what that also means is that that interoperability is extended to the VCL as well as to FireMonkey. So VCL and FireMonkey can take advantage of WinRT APIs as well as all those Win32 APIs and uh, Calm Interop and other interoperability lets you interop with .NET as well. So you can kind of think of Windows 10 as kind of like the United Nations of operating systems, <laughs> at least in the Windows world, for all these APIs. All these APIs can now work together to uh, in harmony, and you can you can uh, build your application and use whatever API makes most sense for each feature. Windows 10 is really gaining popularity rapidly. Uh, Windows 7 still has some use just because of the slow uptake in some enterprises to move forward to new OS versions. But as we saw Gartner saying, by the end of the year, 85% of people are, or enterprises are gonna be moving forward onto that. Windows 8 and XP, are originally I was saying they're almost extinct, but they're actually ahead of Mac OS still, <laughs> which isn't saying a whole lot in the desktop market space, right? Because Mac OS is, and Linux and everything else are less than 10%. So that's about where uh, XP and Windows 8, 8.1. Windows 8 is like almost gone. Windows 8.1 is holding on a little bit still. Uh, but like I said, very, very small margins there. As we just talked about, Windows 10 includes three core APIs all of which are given, uh, we'll say, first-class preference. Uh, .NET, it, it's there, and it does have uh, preferential treatment, just like all the other ones, but no one uses .NET for Windows desktop development. They use it for server development. It's great for you know, ASP.NET. It's really popular. But as far as desktop application development, you really don't see a lot with .NET. And they introduced a new term, um, which replaced a different term they had in Windows 8 time period. And that term is UWP or Universal Windows Platform Applications. And these are apps that are first class Windows 10 applications. And they define that as apps that use the WinRT API. Um, that's kind of an overloaded term. Microsoft likes to do that and overload their terms to do mean lots of different things. So UWP can mean an app that can run on um, Windows desktop, um, Windows IoT devices, HoloLens, and Windows Phone. Uh, I think there's still like a couple percent of Windows Phone out there. There's still, I think the, the uh, analysts are officially saying Windows Phone is dead now, but um, I, you can technically still support it with the UWP, some of UWP apps. So UWP means a lot of things, but at a minimum it means that it uses the WinRT APIs. So we're gonna talk about WinRT later, but first let's talk about some more VCL. So VCL is a, a, an object-oriented programming component library encapsulating the Windows API. The Windows API is not object-oriented. It's an API. That was actually the big thing about .NET is .NET was object-oriented from the ground up. So that was a huge step forward, but it was not native, and so there's lots of down negatives to, to uh, .NET as far as desktop application development goes. So on Microsoft, they have their MFC, Microsoft Foundation Classes, and WinForms, which are .NET specifically. Um, and uh, what is it, WPF, I guess? I don't even know if WPF is still around. I haven't heard anything about that forever. But anyway, 
those are Microsoft's technologies for building um, Windows desktop applications, and they really don't compare to the VCL. VCL also has deep and smooth COM integration, which allows for .NET Framework interop through COM. Um, and actually, there's some other third-party libraries out there that do some amazing uh, .NET Framework interop as well for Delphi. So if that's something that's important to you, uh, you can certainly do some more research into that. There's a number of them out there. Uh, VCL now also has first-class support for the new WinRT API. This means you can mix and match Win API code with WinRT code in your application. Um, some of the new features we're going to talk about do leverage WinRT. Some of them don't leverage WinRT. That means you can use them if you're still supporting earlier versions. We no longer technically support XP. We support Windows um, 7 and newer, but uh, and not Vista either, but Vista, is, <laughs> Vista disappeared a long time ago. Uh, and so, but I have talked to people that are still targeting XP and they said that the latest release Tokyo, you can still build applications to target XP with it fine, but we don't officially support XP. But some of the features do use WinRT APIs and those will only work on Windows 10, maybe Windows 8, um, but Windows 8 is such a small percentage of the marketplace out there, it's really not uh, worth worrying about uh, unless it's specific to your situation. So let's talk about the VCL and Windows 10. What's new in the VCL for Windows 10? We've added some Windows 10 specific styles to give your applications that Windows 10 look and feel. These are our, our usual smart styles that uh, really make your application take on that Windows 10 feel. We also have a number of new VCL components. They were introduced in 10 Seattle and one more in uh, Berlin that uh, add new functionality around Windows 10 that kind of uh, gives you that Windows 10 behavior and, and takes advantage of some of these new UI paradigms. Uh, these were implemented in the VCL. So like I said, they also work on Windows 7, all the VCL components, the visual components do. They're designed to look like the WinRT counterparts, but they don't have a dependency on that. And in some ways, they actually kind of extend the uh, the Windows uh, RT similar components. So the they're better, I think, in that, that way. Plus, you have full source, and you can get in and you know learn from them, descend from them, et cetera. Then we have uh, some, like I said, the, the WinRT support and components that are specific to WinRT. Those are non-visual components and a number of uh, APIs, library wrappers, et cetera. Here's what some of our Windows 10 styles look like. You can see we have a, uh, a dark black style, a blue style, and then the light style there. And we include templates so you can create your own Windows 10 styles as well, which is a great option. We have a new T activity indicator, similar to the um, uh, Fire Monkeys animation animated indicator. That's the little spinning dots, which you see in Windows. It's kind of like, hey, something's going on, but we're not sure when it's gonna end. So that's kind of its uh, objective there which is becoming real prevalent, you know, not anymore. They don't tell you when things are going to end. They're just saying I'm not locked up. <laughs> uh, there's different sizes and different types and color options, uh, etc. This is the activity indicator demo. That's the activity indicator right there. T activity indicator. Go ahead and run this. I'm going to turn animate on. Then we'll see the activity indicator and I can change the size of it. So, We'll go ahead and leave it large, but you can see there's that was medium, and I can also do very smart. So extra large. Um, we can change the colors. So that's white's a little hard to see on here, but I can change the form color or use Windows styles. And so these are the uh, Windows 10 styles. So there you go. There's the uh, regular Windows 10, or I can go with Windows 10 dark style which that white shows up much better on. Different types of indicators as well. You can use this, this one here. It looks, it looks like almost like a Cylon, I guess, uh, or the sector ring. So all three of these are types you'll see commonly on Windows. But there you go, that's the activity indicator and 
the Windows 10 styles. This uh, relative layout panel, this is something I always wanted to be able to do, but it was kind of a pain. Actually, I built some things that did some similar stuff to this, but not as complete as this is. It took me a little while to figure, get my brain wrapped around how this works. But what you do is you put down components and you say this component is relative to another component. So you set the positions via the uh, control collection. And then you, so you can do this at design time or runtime. You can have components uh, positioned relative to each other. So what that's really great for is putting, like for example, a label to the left of an edit box and a button to the right of the edit box. And then you can move those around and they'll always be relative to each other like that. So you, you fix the edit boxes control the location and the other two stay relative to it. Real quick, I'm gonna show you the relative panel. This is the relative panel here. The rest of this is just set up for the relative panel. Uh, something I'm gonna show you here that's really cool is when I select this edit box that's on the relative panel, you'll see down here at the bottom, it has a, a line with bottom with panel uh, and all these other things here that, uh, so I can see above button one. See, so these properties are only there when this edit box is on the relative panel. If I had an edit box on here or anywhere else, if it was on the relative panel, it wouldn't have these properties. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. And so now I can take the edit box and I can say um, above, we'll say above shape one um, and uh, a right of or horizontal center with shape one. So see now it is uh, above shape one. And so now if shape one moves, see the edit moves with it. So that's really cool. Uh, I can take the button now and I can have the button um, to, let's see, right, right of edit one and align vertical center with edit one. All right, so now as I move the shape, the button moves with it. So you can also use, make these so they're spaced apart, stuff like that, that's all supported in there as well. But just for the demo, it's not there. So that that's really cool because it gives you this functionality, the ability to make your controls relative to each other, because that's really what you usually care about, right? And then you can have everything else. Um, you know, I could take the shape now and say shape is aligned with bottom of panel. Let's see, uh, align right of panel, wherever I want to put it. So I, I, I think this is a really great way to do layouts. I wish there was something this in FireMonkey, to be honest. It's not there in FireMonkey yet. Maybe eventually we'll get it in FireMonkey. But this is a very cool way to do your layouts uh, because you can lay them out relative to each other. I do want to point out uh, in your code, these properties don't exist on edit one. But what is available is this control collection. And so you take the control collection of the relative panel and then you can then do that align bottom with panel, um, true or false, right? This is a Boolean, um, stuff like that. So you access those through the control collection and then the uh, index of the control collection to change the um, relative layout of your controls on the relative panel. We have a new uh, T search box that it includes the search indicator and you can use it to search uh, in a list box or any place else. Uh, the, the search functionality is manual, but it has kind of that, the default behavior that you would expect to see from a search box as far as how you would interact with it, uh, with the button in it and such. The new split view is awesome. Uh, it's similar to the FireMonkey multi-view, which I'm really a big fan of, but the split view in some ways kind of extends on what was available in the multi-view, which I do a lot of FireMonkey development and sometimes I'm like, oh man, I wish I could do this like I can in the split view. But what it does is it gives you the ability to um, have these adjustable behaviors and placements where things open and close automatically. So you can have a menu down the side that animates to expand or collapse 
to uh, give you access to different things. It's kind of the new paradigm. Instead of the the main menu across the top that drops down, you have this split view. Uh, you think back, we've had these different paradigms that have come out, right? The Outlook panel was really big back in, I don't remember when Outlook panel was big. It's still big in some things. But the, the main menu, right? Then we had the ribbon control. So this is kind of the new UI paradigm is the is kind of like what the split view supports. This is the T-split view. Uh, the split view components right here. Unlike the multi-view, you're not putting anything on the split view. What we have here is just a uh, split view and it's aligned uh, to with, I guess it's just not aligned, but it's here. And then this is aligned to client. So the split view is next to it. And then what happens is the split view can expand and contract and then this fills the space. Let's go ahead and look at this in action here. So uh, let's see, I want to close on menu click. So there we go, it closes the whole thing. I can open it up, it closes again. Uh, there's two options here, there's docked and overlay. So overlay, it goes over the top, see? I like docked better. Um, and then we can also do the compact style versus the collapse style. So the compact style is kind of cool because it keeps the uh, keeps it visible, the buttons there, right? And so then this is like it's a little quick access bar, right? So really handy for your icons you have down here. But then if you need to see the full more details, you can do that there. Now there's nothing that says this needs to be a list view of items like this. You can really put whatever you want to here. Um, very, very flexible. And uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want to there. But this is just kind of the common use case, use paradigm there. That's the T-split view. And we have a new toggle switch. Similar to the FireMonkey T-switch, this is a toggle switch. You'd use this in place of a on-off radio button or a yes-no radio button. Um, you can, it has customizable labels, so you can change it. You can say left, right, or whatever you want to be, change, to change those labels. Uh, very customizable, very flexible in um, the way it works. And we also have a new VCL calendar control that's very similar to the uh, uh, Windows 10 built-in WinRT style or calendar control. It's fully styled. Get, we have both a calendar picker and a calendar view that you can use. You can see it has the ability to zoom in and out, so which is kind of nice. So if you're moving really far, you can zoom out and jump from year to year, find the year you want, zoom in, select the month, and then select the days, see multi-select days within there. So very, very flexible, very powerful way to select dates with the new calendar control. See, I told you we we're gonna talk about WinRT some more, so let's jump into WinRT. WinRT or Windows Runtime, um, there was a Windows RT that's completely different, that was Windows on uh, ARM, CPUs, which has gone away now. There's no longer around. So Windows is only on Intel devices. Well, yeah, desktop Windows is only on Intel devices, although they do have their Windows IoT, which is runs on all sorts of things. But anyway, that's for another another webinar. WinRT is an object-oriented API, similar to like .NET was, different than Win32 was. But some major differences is it's asynchronous, which means you can't... Um, when you're using WinRT, you don't want to block longer than 50 milliseconds, and it won't block you longer than 50 milliseconds. So if you're going to do something, if you're going to make a call, like to open a file or to look for a file or something like that, something that could take more than 50 milliseconds, you have to do a callback asynchronously. So that's something important to understand. Um, you don't want to block your main thread, and you don't want, it, and it won't block your main thread. That's good programming practices for making a responsive user interface for your users and uh, when RT enforces that. It's native, it's not .NET, so it's completely native, not managed code. Um, and it is COM based, so you use COM. It's, it's, it's similar to COM, it's kind of a new type of COM, I guess you could say, that um, has a different type system, object construction, objects construction and lifetimes are managed similar to how Delphi does the management in COM, the uh, reference counting, like it does for strings and COM objects, um, are done with WinRT. 
Most of that, you're not going to deal with that because of the wrappers that we provide for it. But you want to kind of have an understanding of how this works under the covers. So the RTL, the Runtime Library's Windows Runtime Interface, is a set of helpers to ease the creation of objects. It abstracts dealing with the class factory. So it's all based on these class factories that you use. And you don't have to worry about that because of the runtime interface we have. The, we have over 40 new WinAPI units. So I have a list coming up here of most of those units. And those are the units that wrap all the WinRT API. So 40 new units that wrap all that up for you. We have a new T window string type for, which is the new native, wraps the new native H string type that WinRT uses. So we have different strings now for each platform, but they're easy to move between, thankfully, and you don't have to put a lot of thought into it. So interestingly, and I've seen demos around this, our wrappers make it easier to deal with the WinRT than you would if you're working with C Sharp or Microsoft Visual C++, which of course you expect that, right? I mean, Delphi and C++ Builder are all about making developers more productive while being able to create native, powerful, performant applications. And that's still the case with our WinRT support. Here's a list of, I don't think this is all of them, but I think it's most of the WinRT uh, API units. And you'll see the last one there is system.win.winrt. So it's got the different naming convention, but that's the, the basic one that provides the WinRT functionality. So it has uh, the different name, but then all the rest of these are WinRT API wrappers. So you see, we have some around credentials, uh, cryptography, Bluetooth, um, which means we now have Bluetooth RT, uh, Bluetooth LE support on Windows 10, which is great to have that available to us. Um, lots of different options here. So if you're wanting to make a low-level WinRT call, uh, this is referenced by Interface for automatic reference counting, like I mentioned earlier. You're going to use the T window string, which comes from the system.win.winrt unit. And you can use the dot factory to access other constructors, or if you choose the default constructor, it's gonna use the parameter list constructor, which in most cases is all you need. Uh, if there's a static member of the class you need to access, then it's under dot statics, and you can access it there. So most of the time you're just gonna create an object like normal, um, but you're gonna keep it an interface reference to it. But if you do need to access some of the other type of constructors, then you use dot factory to get access to those constructors. Now you don't have to do that in most situations. You can just use some of the WinRT base components we've provided. So we have the T-sharing contract and the T-share contract. Uh, the T-sharing contract is a VCL component and the T-share contract is actually a, a class in RTL. So it can be used uh, without having to instantiate the component. It's kind of a little bit lower level maybe than the sharing contract VCL component. And it can also be used from uh, VCL, FireMonkey, console applications, uh, services, you know, anywhere else you might want to. We have a notification component so that you can have notifications like you see there on the right-hand side. Uh, that one's from Berlin. I guess we should update that screenshot for Tokyo. Uh, they still work in Tokyo. <laughs> and uh, also it introduced in Berlin was the Bluetooth LE support. So there's a Bluetooth LE component in addition to the existing Bluetooth component that works on Windows 10. Let's talk about the Windows Desktop Bridge. This was originally uh, codenamed the Centennial Bridge, Microsoft Centennial Bridge. And what this does is this bridges applications that use Win32 or Win64 to become universal Windows platform applications, which means they are bundled up as an AppX and can be installed uh, with kind of a sandbox system and distributed through the Windows Store. So what this is, is it's a, a zip file, essentially, the AppX is, that contains a manifest and then all the other files that are necessary for your application. So if you have uh, some other files, whether it be a embedded database file or a configuration file or uh, another DLL or whatever it is, those are all bundled up in this zip file, which is called an AppX. And then that AppX can be 
downloaded and updated and uninstalled and e- easily installed and uninstalled with this much more streamlined system, similar to like it is on a mobile device, right? So on mobile device, you know, you don't run an installer. You just install the app from the app store, right? And it just comes down, boop, it's installed, it's done. And then it updates automatically. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to go through, oh, you have to manually uninstall and reinstall your application to install this. No, none of that. It just greatly streamlines this. It also does some sandboxing, which means that your application can't or won't go out and write to random places in the registry or the file system. Um, All of that, it's either writing to its own specific area of the registry or file system, or it is uh, being sandboxed. So if your app tries to write outside of its registry area, it thinks it did, but guess what? It really didn't. It wrote to its own sandboxed area of the registry. Now, you can still open and interact with user files, right? So if their user has a document in my documents, in their documents folder or on their desktop or something like that, your application can still interact with those, but it's not going to write to files in the uh, Windows system folder, for example, right? Windows Sys 32 or whatever. Um, It can't access those. It can read them, but you can't write to them. If it tries to write to them, it will think it did, but it won't actually write to them. Uh, The only limitation... I don't know if it's the only limitation. The The big limitation that prevents an application from being able to use the desktop bridge is if your application tries to escalate uh, privileges, right? So if your application ever tries to go to admin privileges where the user has to click and accept admin privileges, it can't be in the uh, desktop bridge. But pretty much everything else can be in the desktop bridge. I guess the other restriction would be is if your application really needed to um, be- break out of that sandboxing. If the sandboxing wasn't compatible with your application, then it couldn't work in the desktop bridge. But anything else, it, it can be on the desktop bridge. So that's that's really a, a great thing. It makes it really easy for you to bring your existing applications forward. Now, if you're using one of Microsoft's tools or you just like understanding how the desktop bridge works, this is the process you would go through to build an AppX manually. Um, There's actually two ways of building an AppX manually. One way involves um, it like scanning the process of you running an installation and seeing what files your installer touches and what registry keys you know, and config files. I mean, just, you know, going out watching everything it does and then trying to bundle all that up. Now, luckily with uh, Delphi and C++ Builder application deployment, usually we don't need to do all of that crazy uh, stuff. So this is a much simpler approach if you know exactly what you want to put in to your app X. Um, you uh, package up your app. So we have a map file and the um, everything package that up. Then we sign it. With our certificates, you have to have a certificate. Um, they have instructions on how to create your certificate, uh, a locally signed certificate, but you sign it. And then you install the certificate on your machine. And then once you've done that, then you enable side loading on your machine so that you can test it. Um, that's under security and developer options. Once you've done that, then you can uh, b- bundle up an AppX and install it locally. Now, Luckily, we have Windows 10 support built into the IDE, and this is something even Visual Studio didn't have. So we were way ahead of uh, anything else out there as far as being able to make an AppX right from the IDE. Uh, You'll notice there's two options here. There's Application Store and Normal. That's because um, Microsoft wants you to send it to Application Store unsigned, but if you want to debug it locally, then you do Normal, okay? And normal signs it so that you can run it locally. It signs it with a self-signed certificate so that you can uh, run it locally as far as for debugging purposes. So some more details about the IDE-based Windows Store support. And, and we actually did a joint press release or something like that with Microsoft as well. And they created some trainings around it because they were like, wow, you guys are supporting it better than we are. <laughs> they, they didn't say that, but that was the reality is we were supporting their their desktop bridge in Windows 10 better than Microsoft's development tools. So it can uh, generate your AppX for you automatically. You can use the deployment manager to add additional things to your bundle. 
so all your assets, runtime packages, database DLLs, etc., all get bundled up together. The um, you do have to have the Windows 10 SDK installed for the packaging and code signing. So those utilities that perform those steps are provided with Windows SDK, which comes with when you install Delphi, C++ Builder, or Rad Studio. So you have options for either testing an ad hoc distribution. So testing would be testing on your local machine or ad hoc distribution would be uh, just deploying someone directly. And then store deployment, like I said, is for if you're wanting to go through the Windows Store for distribution that way, which is a great option. The users can go uh, and grab your application from the store or through some sort of ad hoc distribution. It installs quickly and easily, can update quickly and easily, uh, uninstall quickly and easily without leaving anything behind. Windows Store distribution is really a game changer for the platform. Microsoft introduced the Windows Store a while ago, and they just never really got any uptake on it. And that was because they kept trying to restrict it, right? They're like, oh, it's it's using only the, the, the WinRT APIs and their JavaScript development, and that didn't work. No one wanted to do that. I mean, there was a lot of apps in there. They were paying people to put apps in there, and they got a lot of junk apps. <laughs> you know, it was pretty bad. So Windows 10, they're like, okay, you can use Win32, you can use .NET, you can use WinRT, whatever you want to do, then use the desktop bridge and you can get in the Windows Store. So that's a huge step forward. Uh, this was added in Windows 10 anniversary support, which I think was like a year ago now. So it's been around for a while. Most everybody should be on it because they're getting updates automatically. Microsoft's a kind of aggressive in Windows 10 about sending out those updates. They actually have a whole new edition out coming out, the creator update. I, I think that's what they're calling it. Um, you do need to uh, request permission to your, well, you have to have a developer account with Microsoft and then you have to have desktop bridge developer account with Microsoft. If you don't, then you'll get an error message saying that you're, um, you don't have your, or your package isn't validated that you don't have desktop app converter support yet. So just have to make that request from Microsoft. Let me show you how to build an app X. So first thing is you come over here, target platforms, expand this out. Win32 configuration. And by default, we're installing in the app store, or I'm sorry, we're installing normal, but we can select app store, application store, and we hit build. And because it's the first time it's gonna ask me for my Windows SDK, which gets installed when you first set everything up. And that's gonna come in here and ask me to set up a certificate. Now we use a, a certificate for ad hoc distribution or for local machine debugging purposes. And I can just go ahead and hit create certificate and it's gonna put it in this folder here. That's sure that looks great. Let's give it a name of uh, signed cert and a password. And now it's creating my certificate. Now, if I wanted to do store deployment, I would use this instead. And this is, I would uh, describe it for the store and then Microsoft manages the certificate and does the final signing. So we hit okay, finishes building my application and it's been successfully built. So I can uh, jump out there and find it. And we see right here, uh, there's our application. There's the manifest file. There is the DCU, but then in here, we will find the AppX. So this AppX can now be opened, which will give us the option to install it. Oh, I haven't installed my certificate. So I need to install that certificate. Let's do that real quick. Um, so I need to install this certificate here. And I can do that via the run command. So we'll install our certificate. Let's do local machine. Yes. Next. Always remember your passwords. Occasionally I hear you'll say, I forgot to install my password. Nope, that won't work. Okay, root, trusted root certificate. I think I want trusted root certificate authorities. 
import was successful, and now we run this and it installs. So you have to install it to local machine because you're installing the software on the machine. So it's installed it, I can launch it, and there's the application. Uh, it's also available here in, if I go to my start, see there's project 31, I can run it from here. Now of course you may be wondering how to debug it. So you could debug it uh, just from the ID as a normal application, but you can also debug it from here. You can just come here and go run, um, where is it at? Attach to process, project 31, attach, just like normal. And I come in here and let's put a breakpoint on my event handler. And I can run this, boop, and there's the breakpoint stops. So there you go, there's uh, building an AppX, uh, installing your local certificate, self-signed certificate, and debugging it from the IDE. Marco Cantu developed his minifig app, My Minifigs, with his son. That's a way you can collect pictures of Lego minifigs. He has it on the Android App Store, the iOS App Store, and now it's in the Windows App Store. So you can get it on your Windows desktop. Uh, all built with the same code, all with Delphi and uh, FireMonkey. So this is a FireMonkey application that's in the Windows 10 store through the desktop bridge. It also works beautifully with uh, VCL applications. So the question is, do you cross the bridge? What is, what is your strategy here? In Windows 8, there's very limited WinRT adoption, um, which is why Microsoft introduced the bridge for desktop and mobile applications. Mobile bridges, some of them got removed and uh, canceled. Uh, some of the other ones got scaled back. I'm not even sure if their mobile bridge is around. But their desktop bridge, it's out, it's going, and it's, it's making a big difference. Uh, so they're really pushing it as a migration step, except for the idea to bridge the gap on your way to NRT land. So they have recommend approach where you start with uh, your AppX that uh, contains both a Win32 and Win app. WinRT app combined, and then later on move to full WinRT. But there, so far, there doesn't appear to be any requirement around that, and there's no real big reason to because everything you can want to access is available to you from um, your Delphi or C++ app because it can access both those Win32 and WinRT APIs. Microsoft has added a new Windows 10 S, which S is for security and stability, I think is that what they're going for there. And what one of the things it does is it says you can only use Microsoft Edge browser and you can only have apps installed from the App Store. I'm curious to see how big of a t impact this is gonna have, if it's really take off or not. But if it does, then this is, you can be on that platform, your apps can be on that platform if you're using the desktop bridge. In summary, Microsoft is making Win32 and 64-bit applications first class again. So just like they were way back in the day with uh, uh, Windows XP and uh, Windows NT 3. Point, was it 3.5? Win632 and Win64 first class again. This they're making a big push towards the universal plat Windows platform and their store, um, but that's all open to you with your Win32 and Win64 applications. VCL, like I said, continues to be the best Windows client library. It is so much easier to use, so much more productive, and really, no one else is really innovating on that platform anymore. There's no one else is putting any effort into supporting developers there. Make, like I said, they're making Win32 and Win64 first class again, but they're really not providing any great new libraries and development tools around that. Uh, but VCL continues to be the best. Uh, FireMonkey also enjoys this support. The number of features, FireMonkey uh, has the Windows 10 styles and has the access to the WinRT APIs and so on and so forth, but it's more focused on cross-platform requirements. And there are some situations, some types of applications, FireMonkey is much better for on Windows than the VCL, but uh, VCL is still the recommended. If you're only on Windows, VCL is a good choice. Bottom line is that Embarcadero is committed to keeping Delphi, C++ Builder, and VCL focused on the evolving Windows 10 platform. Uh, 
we're putting a lot of effort into other platforms as well. Uh, Linux, Android, Mac OS, iOS, but we're still focused on Windows. Windows is still incredibly important to you and it's just still incredibly important, important to us. Now it's time for questions. Uh, there's a couple of questions here already. Uh, one of which is uh, when week numbers will show up in the T calendar view. As far as I, if that that's an interesting idea, there. As far as I know, that's not on the roadmap. But if you add a feature request to uh, quality.marketerror.com, product management will see that and they will possibly uh, consider that for a future release. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Hey Jim, it's uh, Stephen here as well. Oh, great. Um, Hey Hans, um, one of the um, one of the options potentially. I was just having a quick look. There's on the calendar view. There is a, a draw day item property. Um, uh, so event. Uh, so what you can do is you could use. Um, there's a a method called decode date fully, and if you use that, you can uh, pass in a date which you can get from the um, the parameters for that um, uh, draw day item. Uh, in there, there's a, a calendar view. Um, view item and um, info uh, and that has the date for the cell that is being drawn uh, and you can decode that into a, a year month day and day of week which is what the decode date fully provides and then uh, using uh, because you've got the calendar view in in focus uh, you can actually use the uh, vcl.winx calendars unit uh, in there there's a, a t days of week um, and uh, if you just take the ordinal value of that plus one, you'll get the specific day of week, which you can then compare against the, the date um, extract. And then uh, the other parameter that's in that calendar view uh, draw day item is the um, draw parameters. And in there, you can set the, um, the cell's text. So, for example, if you're using it for a booking system, you could ch change the date to B or something. Um, there's a group text, which I'm, I'm not quite sure what that's for. Um, but there is a selected color, focus color, background color. So you can change the, uh, the color of the cells to represent whatever you need it to show. Um, and also, using the draw params, you can get to the canvas. So you could just do a, a draw directly onto the canvas cell of the day of week. Just use the OW to string and um, uh, bang, you'll be able to put that and do that yourself um, pretty quickly in a few lines of code. Okay, great. There's another question that asks about being able to display texture graphics within days in the calendar. Sounds like that's the, uh, the same item then? Yeah, I think that's exactly the same thing. You can certainly change it. Um, you can modify the height of the text and width of the text. Um, and obviously, the bigger you have it, the uh, the more space you've got to play within each cell. Um, the other thing you can do, um, one of the properties allows you to modify the number of weeks to view. So you can show between two and eight weeks um, across the calendar view. Um, I tried to put 52 in to see if it would give me anything. It said, no, 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 two to eight. Um, so you can show quite a number of weeks um, and then obviously just play around with the, the draw params uh, to, to modify the actual content that's shown in the cell. All right. That's great. Thank you. I hadn't looked into that. Uh, another question here is, will there be a T web browser VCL for Edge? Uh, a good, another good uh, question. I would assume that you can uh, import that like you can the uh, T web browser for, based on an Explorer. Uh, chances are it won't be a component for a while just because uh, the IE component works fine, IE base component works fine, and it's going to show up on more platforms, but in the future, that may, we may see that as a component on the tool palette um, once the uh, number of systems the support is higher, although you could certainly support it yourself till then. I'll have to look into that and see. That's a good idea, though. Casper's asking about... Um, Downloading and installing the Windows SDK himself. I put the link in there for you for that. If you just go to Microsoft's developer site, there is a download for the Windows 10 SDK uh, that you can download. It's, uh, I think it's, it's pretty good size, but uh, you should be able to get it, no problem. Um, David's asking, how do you see the future evolving with regard to third-party component support for VCL? As long as people are using 
or buying third party components from our tech partners for the VCL, I imagine they'll continue to be <laughs> providing those components. Um, yeah, I, I, a number of uh, them are still releasing new components for VCL, and I suspect that will continue to be the case. I, uh, it's one of those things that just because the VCL is mature does not mean it's going away by any stretch of the imagination. It's uh, very important to to us, to our customers, and to our tech partner. Uh, one thing I do see in the future is more and more of these components are showing up in uh, Get It, and that will continue to be the case. That uh, the Get It uh, package manager will continue to evolve and be easier to ins find and install components from there. Uh, that's the biggest change I might see in the future, I guess. But uh, I'm not sure if you had any more questions about around that, David, or if that's kind of what you had in mind. But that's what I see in the future is that we'll see continue to see uh, components on VCL, and they'll probably be available through GitHub. Uh, Jens is asking if there's any security tools like Fortify available for Delphi. So just looking at uh, Fortify, I, Fortify might work with Delphi. I don't know. I mean, well, well, one of the things that's quite good with um, Delphi anyway is that uh, I'm not quite sure what Fortify does. Um, I've not actually it's not a product that I've actually had a look into, um, but all the code is compiled anyway, so it's quite obs um, obscured. Um, initially. Um, so I know there's a lot of programs that are used to help protect applications that are written in intermediary languages like Java and C Sharp um, because uh, they're a lot easier to reverse engineer. Uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, um, because everything we do is compiled native applications and not only they're fast, not only can you get to every API you want to get to because you're, you're like running down on the metal, um, they're also exceptionally secure um, by nature to start off with. So uh, it'd be interesting to understand what you're looking for Fortify to provide you as a capability and um, maybe you could put another comment in. Well, I was actually, I was looking at Fortify and um, it scans the applications to make sure the applications aren't introducing uh, behavior that would cause security issues. Although it appears as static code analysis and not uh, binary analysis, although they don't list I haven't seen where they list what uh, languages or IDEs or APIs and such to support. So I'm that, that, curious to know more information about Fortify. Like I said, it may work with Delphi. It, it may not. There are other Delphi static code analysis tools. Um, TMS has the uh, has one. Uh, code Healer has one. Uh, yeah, I, I, none of them are focused on uh, security vulnerabilities, although I do know that one of the big things that causes uh, security vulnerabilities on most other programming languages is the buffer overflow, right? The fact that you can load in a, um, a string that's larger than the string supports and it causes a buffer overflow. And that's actually not a attack vector for uh, Delphi or C++ Builder. Well, I guess you could do it that way, but because of the native string types that are built into Delphi and C++ Builder that we have the the, the string, there, you can't have a buffer overflow on those. Now, if you could allocate a buffer manually and have that problem, but it's a much less likely scenario with uh, Delphi or C++ Builder. Also, numbers um, all its metrics are built into enterprise as well. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, 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 John Savage is saying occasionally Norton Security will block various VCL apps that have been developed under Delphi's under Delphi flagging sonar heuristics threat. So interestingly, um, legitimate software developers are not the only people that know how amazingly productive Delphi are. Delphi is. And a number of uh, developers that are developing um, uh, exploitative, exploitative apps also use Delphi. And so what happens with the sonar heuristics is they look for similarities between Delphi applica or between applications to applications that are known to be uh, problems. And that's what happens is they're like, oh, hey, this is developed with Delphi. Delphi is occasionally used by hackers. 
Therefore, we're going to flag it as potentially being a um, a problem. So, and uh, yeah, I, it, it's annoying. It happens, but I'm not sure what. The, I'm not sure there's anything we can do. But uh, when we do find uh, that it gets really bad, we do let Norton know, like, hey, you can't flag every Delphi app as a, a virus or. Yeah. It's not just Norton. Occasionally, we get false positives, um, which is, you know, Delphi is very, very popular. It's been around for a long time, and unfortunately, sometimes, um, you know, they're they're scanning for for viruses, picks up the wrong things to check for. Um, if you do ever get that, then let us know. We've got um, pretty good procedures in place for alerting them of false positives, and um, you can do the same on their websites as well. Uh, and it's normally cleaned up pretty pretty quickly um to be fair to them so yeah. um, if it does happen then just make sure you just contact support um let us know um let them know and uh, they normally have it fixed pretty pretty soon yep exactly yeah just let support know or contact them directly all right well it is top of the hour and i think we should wrap it up here thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you online at future webinars okay take care everybody happy coding take care bye-bye if you have any additional questions, feel free to put them in the question panel in the GoToWebinar software, and we'll get them answered for you. There's a few questions already in here. Um, with all those legacy APIs like .NET, WinRT, UWP, and whatnot, what API is Microsoft using themselves in new programs? So this is actually <laughs> very summary summarized version of the APIs that Microsoft has, has evolved from over the years. There's actually a lot of them that they've uh, deprecated over time, uh, especially like data access components and um, such stuff like that. So th I believe they're mostly still using the Win32 and WinRT. Um, WinRT really has some good potential on Windows desktop to start to take off more now, but uh, because of the fact that Windows 10 still supports Win32 as a full first-class citizen, uh, I will probably still continue to see that supported for quite some time. Uh, so everything I showed you, I didn't really get into the, the WinRT APIs, but all of those are usable from um, Windows desktop or VCL, FireMonkey, console applications, uh, services, whatever, on the Windows platform. So those can be used from anywhere. They're not uh, tied to a specific platform. So you have a code signing certificate. Um, what that, I'm not sure how that rolls into the bridge, to be honest, uh, Jeffrey. But what that does is that if someone downloads something from your site, you the code signing certificate shows that it, it was in fact downloaded from you and you are who you claim to be, which can be useful. But I think that if it's going through Microsoft store through the bridge that Microsoft is signing it in that case, but you would need to talk to Microsoft to get all the details on that for sure. So if you're developing from WinRT uh, using Microsoft's tools, they have some interop with .NET uh, from Delphi. You can interop with .NET using um, crosstalk or using com to call into .NET Framework. So there, all of the different APIs that are in use right now are interoperable between each other. Okay, the question here, can we have both VCL and FireMonkey components in the same program? There is, let me find it real quick, a, um, a, a component, if I can find it here, that lets you embed a, um, Oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank here. Let's you embed FireMonkey components into a VCL application. So I can find it real quick here. There we go. I think this is it here. Okay, on a, there's a T FireMonkey container, and the T FireMonkey container lets you put a. Um, it's a VCL component that you can put on a VCL form, which hosts or embeds a FireMonkey form. So I'll put that in the chat window here, or I'll put it in the answer to your question. There are some other, there's some issues around that in other ways, but this this one is the one I've heard of that seems to work the best. Um, take a look at that. The, the documentation only says through XC7, but it probably works with newer versions as well. 
Oh, I put that on the wrong question. All right. Um, is there a tree view light component as in VCL in Fire Monkey? You know, uh, TMS has some amazing uh, Fire Monkey components. Oh, there is a. Oh, there is one here. Here it is. There is a custom tree view in uh, Fire Monkey. Yeah, T tree view. So yes, there is. I wasn't aware of that. Always surprised how many little things. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, I put that in the wrong. I'm pasting these wrong answers. I apologize. Uh, what is the best way to integrate Cortana or speech recognition functionality in Delphi? Does the VCL contain any wrapper for the underlying API? Oh, let me look real quick. I don't remember if that one is wrapped or not. It may be. Um, so I actually looked at this a while ago before the bridge came out. One of the requirements is, is in order to use Cortana, you had to be uh, in an AppX, which is installed differently. So it, I believe it will work now that the bridge is available and you can uh, just play, play your app as an AppX. But I, uh, to be honest, have not looked at it since the bridge came out. So, um, yeah, I don't see it in there right now, so it might not be in the um, already support, already wrapped, but you could probably wrap that to work with it. Um, so maybe possible. I don't know for sure. Right. Hints over the controls and IDE forms for FireMonkey forms. Actually, isn't there? I thought that was added. Let me look real quick. I thought for sure, because I remember that wasn't there originally, but I thought it was added recently that you could have mouse hints on uh, FireMonkey controls. Yeah, it's there. There's a hint property. Hint. And I'll run it real quick and make sure. Yep. Yeah, it's there, Mark. Uh, you could, there's a hint property. Just set, turn the, set the, give the hint property a value, and it shows up when the mouse is over it. Oh, I meant while designing the form in the IDE, saying the origin size of the component. Oh, in the form designer. Okay, yeah, I see what you said there now. Um, there might be the, the, the fire monkey designer and the VCL designer are different. They're, uh, from the ground up, completely different designers. So it could be eventually get there. I would definitely say putting a, uh, suggest putting a feature request into quality.embarcadero.com and they will, uh, look at those and possibly add those in the future. I have not heard any plans around that but that doesn't mean they're not in the works or that i have just or maybe i've even forgotten them but do put it in as a feature request or look to see if it is a feature request and if not add it and uh, product management will look that over all right well it looks like it's top of the hour so we need to wrap things up thank you so much for joining us and i'm glad you enjoyed this webinar and look forward to seeing you online at future webinars Good luck and happy coding, everybody.